Show them, let's just give them a couple more minutes. They just finished the uh, oncology conference. Sounds good. Should I get started here, Ashley? I think, or? I think we can for the, there may be some people they are gonna join. I'm pretty sure they're, they're gonna join in. Um, everyone may know Dr. Kundu, but Dr. Kundu is our the professor of urology here at uh, Northwestern Feinberg, and he's also the chief of urologic oncology. Um, he's uh, um, done research and published in, in many, re, uh, many areas across the spectrum of genital urinary malignancy, but has had a particular interest in um, inflammatory bowel disease and um, its impact on malignancy. And, and really thank you for sharing this today with us, uh, Shom, and, and we look forward to the talk. Great. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining. Um, I wanted to share with you a couple of uh, things that I've been working on over the course of the last couple of years. And some of this may be preclinical and a bit dry, but I wanted to um, really kind of share with you what I've kind of stumbled across a couple of years ago after kind of coming up with, a, coming across a few patients um, with IBD and assessing their risk of prostate cancer. Really not much data existed, and I'll tell you why I did. Oops. So, you know, this is a patient that I saw in the clinic, um, and this was the first patient I saw of many who um, essentially presented to me uh, way back in, I think it was 2015, um, when he presented with an elevation in his PSA close to around eight. And this gentleman had Crohn's disease for a long time, uh, relapsing, remitting, occasional flares and whatnot. And you can see over the course of probably the four years prior to his PSA had been certainly sub four. I took a little spike up, came back down, um, and then started going up into the five, six, seven. Um, and I think we saw him at a rate PSA of nine. And reality is most pe the people who um, had seen him uh, really thought that his PSA elevation was likely due to his Crohn's disease and likely, likely not related to prostate cancer. There's this little downtrend you see here um, in the in the in the PSA once he had once he had a, a flare treated, but then it went right back up within a short period of time uh, to above five. So that really prompted um, 
me to ask the question and I think a lot I asked actually pulled a lot of the members of our group um, you know what's going on and in fact I asked a lot of the GI doctors is there any association between elevations in PSA and gut inflammation and most people said yes probably and that's what they thought but really there was zero data to actually uh, say that gut inflammation and this chronic inflammatory condition that this man and many other men have was associated with elevations in PSA there really was no really um, uh, really no data qualifying whether this is just a false elevation PSA, whether it was true, and that was what prompted me to start studying this. Um, and that's where that's where the, this talk comes from. So, what I want to do today is outline the potential mechanisms of how, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a spoiler alert. Um, I think the answer is yes, there is an association, and I want to. Um, essentially outline to you the potential mechanisms of how chronic gut inflammation uh, in men modulates the risk of prostate cancer. Share with you what I think there may be some shared genetics between these two disease states, IBD and prostate cancer, and how a lot of these men, uh, actually patients, but certainly men um, who take these chronic medications, specifically TNF-alpha inhibitors, how mitigation of this chronic inflammation, the systemic inflammation can modulate this, that, that man's cancer risk. And that's newer data, but I thought I wanted to share, with, share some of it with you. So what is inflammatory bowel disease? It's a chronic inflammatory condition affecting the gut. It affects, uh, sorry, uh, patients are usually diagnosed between the ages of 15 and 35, so they're generally young. And so by the time they, if a man has uh, inflammatory bowel disease, he's likely, when he approaches, PSA screening or prostate screening age, um, you know, decades, if not uh, three to four decades worth of this worth of this chronic inflammation, um, you know, prior to presenting with prostate cancer screening age, it affects about one million men in the United States and many more million in the in the worldwide. And the disease severity is variable. Some patients have very severe disease. Um, some have milder disease, but it's almost invariable that patients will have some flare ups. Um, you know, if not once a year, uh, if not a couple of times a year, but certainly uh, inflammation and flares tend to be more common than not. And many of these patients with more severe disease are managed with TNF-alpha blockade, which I'll talk about at the end of this talk. So there are two major types of ulcerative, I'm sorry, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. I'm sure many of you have heard of what these are. But there are distinctions, while it is grouped into inflammatory bowel disease, there are distinctions between what they are in terms of where it happens and uh, 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 histologically what areas are inflamed. Ulcerative colitis is generally limited. It starts in the rectum and it works up um, towards the small intestines, but does not involve the small intestines. It's limited to the colon and rectum and tends not to have skip lesions. Um, it also tends to be a mucosa and submucosal inflammation. It's not transmural. Crohn's disease may involve anywhere, uh, any, any part of the GI tract, specifically lower GI tract, um, and it is a frequent transmural um, inflama inflammatory uh, process. So there is, there is data um, that has shown there's an increased risk of gastrointestinal malignancy in patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. There is some data specifically as relates to lymphoma um, that uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients are at an increased risk. And the key, dri key drivers of these um, malignancies are thought to be from longstanding inflammation, specifically in the gut as relates to gut-related malignancies, colon, liver, stomach, esophageal. But there may be a driving force between, between behind immunosuppression and their cancer risk. And so this shows this graphically. Um, this is data that was published uh, last year in the in, in digestion, saying that there is uh, two schools of thoughts: one, inflama inflammatory related malignancies, and how immunosuppression um, can affect malignancies. And kind of we tried to tackle. I've tried to tackle the um, those questions uh, within within the scope of the work that we've done. So how do patients who so patients with IBD get colonoscopies? I believe annually, um, because they're at a much higher risk of developing colon cancer. Um, and these are different from sporadic colon cancers. Chronic inflammation leads to increase in reactive oxygen species, inflammation, ultimately DNA damage, um, 
uh, upregulation in certain inflammatory pathways such as the TNF alpha pathway, STAT3, NF kappa B, and ultimately the sequential acquiring of DNA damage and ultimately DNA, I'm sorry, um, uh, yeah, DNA damage to um, certain regulatory uh, cell cycle regulators does is uh, then causes progression of these uh, cancers in IBD in a much faster rate than a sporadic colon cancer. Oops. So uh, the question is, is there an association between these men with chronic inflammation of the prostate, their PSA specifically, and prostate cancer? So the first question I thought was, uh, my hypothesis was that it truly was just gut inflammation, and somehow this gut inflammation is being transmitted to the prostate, and that, that there was no increased risk of prostate cancer, although the few patients I had seen anecdotally at the time, uh, both were diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, I thought it was just purely an anecdotal process. Um, and then is there an association between this uh, gut, gut inflammation and prostate cancer risk? So first, does how does it affect the prostate? Does it affect the PSA? And like I say, the patients that I'd seen elevated PSA, both of them were assumed to have gut inflammation leading to an elevation in PSA. I asked everybody in the department, everybody in the GI department, nobody knew the answer and said, yes, it probably is gut inflammation, but we didn't really know why. So the first thing we did is we actually looked at our own institutional data set or system-wide data set over the course of about 20 years. And we identified a thousand men who were had IBD and they were followed within our NM system um, uh, with serial PSAs. And we matched that to 9,000 controls um, who also had a similar amount of PSA screening and followed these men over time within our NM data, score, data set. And what you can see is these are, I think, about 33,000 PSA values plotted in these 10,000 men um, over the course of their uh, uh, life here at NM. And as you can, what you can see here is, while it's small, it is a significant increase or divergence of the PSA. The green line represents men with IBD and the purple line represents non-IBD patients. There is a divergence of this PSA at the age of 55, and that's interestingly when we start screening, but there were men screening uh, screened prior because a lot of these patients were probably screened before the USPSTF um, recommendations uh, came out several years ago. Um, but you can see a divergence in their PSA, and while it's small, it is significant and statistically significant. Um, and I wanted to just share with you this may not look a lot, look like a big difference, but this is um, data from several years ago looking at the PSA level in Africa in black men compared to non-black men. And you can see this is longer and it goes out to the age of 70 and beyond and we didn't have that data. But if you look at this portion of the curve, it actually looks quite similar. Um, and I don't think it's really all that controversial that black men are at a higher risk of prostate cancer and more aggressive prostate cancer, but you can almost, not quite, overlay these uh, PSA curves when you look at the age ranges of 55 and 70, um, which I thought was interesting. So the next, so that was interesting in the sense that, all right, the PSA level um, diverges, but what's the rate of prostate cancer? So what we showed, interestingly enough, is when you took into account age, race, the number of PSA screening exams, hospital encounters, encounters with the, uh, with the, with the NM system, that the rates of uh, overall prostate cancer were different. There was actually about a fourfold increased risk in men who had inflammatory bowel disease compared to non-IBD patients in being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so the next question, well, what if it's all just low-grade prostate cancer? And so the right side here represents the clinically significant prostate cancer, which we defined as grade group two or higher. And indeed, even within that cohort, there was about a fourfold increased risk of being diagnosed with a grade group two or higher prostate cancer in men with IBD. Further, when we stratified by um, age at the initial PSA, so men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s compared to um, non-IBD patients, um, had a significantly increased risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer, which did increase as a function of the decade of life uh, uh, in which they were detected. And then finally, looking at their initial PSA um, uh, and, and what, what that did in terms of portending a future risk of prostate cancer, you can see an uptrend in both uh, 
but certainly the trend in men with inflammatory bowel disease was much more striking in terms of their risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer um, based upon their initial PSA. So that was our own system-wide data. Um, and the nice thing about using system-wide data is that you actually have uh, data that's annotated. We can actually look at individual patient data, the number of PSAs, what their PSA was, the Gleason grade, staging. Um, but the downside is it's obviously on, uh, single system based. Um, so we then worked to look to uh, validate our uh, data within the United Kingdom Biobank, which is a prospective population based registry in the United Kingdom, which encompasses England, Wales and Scotland. And uh, there's over 500,000 patients of whom at the time were there were 200 over 200,000 men um, whose information is recorded and tracked by the National Health Service. So we knew who had IBD and we knew he was eventually diagnosed with prostate cancer. What I don't have and I hope to get at some point is their clinic, uh, sorry, their, their prostate cancer staging and grading information. And what we found is uh, this Kaplan Meyer represents the um, freedom from being diagnosed with prostate cancer and the top line represents um, patients controls versus um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and what we can find that what we saw that there truly was an increased risk uh, of being diagnosed with prostate cancer within this UK biobank um, uh, in, in, in a prostate cancer diagnosis. Interestingly enough in the UK um, PSA screening is not widely practiced. The, there is opportunistic screening um, and I think in the overall cohort prior, uh, I think there was estimates of about 30% who were screened for PSA. So some of these may be actually um, clinic, clinically detected prostate cancers. So I don't exactly, I can't tell you exactly how many were screen detected or, or clinically detected, but I, I suspect some of these were clinically relevant and clinically detected or, or for, cause, for cause diagnoses. Now, the data was not as robust as in our own institutional data set, um, and this is a busy slide, but overall there was about a 30%, 33% increased risk if you had inflammatory bowel disease that within this UK biobank that you were diagnosed, a man was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And within this data, the ulcerative colitis patients actually um, were mainly responsible for this increased risk. We did not find that with Crohn's disease. So a little different from our data, but did validate that there was an increased risk within a large population-based 200,000 patient cohort. So why is this happening? So is this local inflammation? So bacteria or local inflammatory signals which are being transmurally uh, uh, going into the prostate? Is it systemic inflammation such that cytokines or bacteria are going into the bloodstream and ending up in the prostate? Is it immunosuppression that many of these patients take? Or is it a genetic predisposition? So the next part of this, uh, this talk is just saying how we looked at um, some men with prostate cancer, their biopsy slides, and we did a mouse model to actually study it. So we actually looked at a group of men. Um, it's hard to get tissue from patients that are not prospectively collected, um, at least at the time it was, to get um, tissue to and, and, you, and, and compare it to controls. But what we found here is the top, the top row represents uh, controls, the bottom row represents IBD patients, and there was a higher level of staining of T, both T and B lymphocytes um, within um, men who had prostate cancer including uh, CD4 and T, uh, CD4 and CD8 uh, T lymphocytes within the, the tissue. Now this was a small group, but it really led us to the next step is to try to develop a preclinical model um, to see if we, what, what's going on within the prostate. So what we did is we took mice. Uh, there are several well-established um, IBD mouse models, and one of them is a chemically induced uh, IBD mouse model. You give these mice something called dextran sodium sulfate it's a complex polysaccharide. It essentially, essentially disrupts the mucosa of the gut epithelium, mainly of the colon, um, and it causes direct epithelial cell damage. And it mimics. It's it's a well-established model for um, uh, IBD in the mouse. And so, what we did is we gave them at the age of nine weeks a week of DSS. Then they get two weeks of rest. Um, and then we repeated that twice. And the blue line represents the weight of the mice, and the red line represents the DSS treated mice. And as expected, and you would expect once they get DSS, uh, 
they drop their weight, you give them a break, they recover, they drop it, they recover, and then they drop it again. So this is in line with um, what we would expect. Um, and it does mimic a chronic inflammatory bowel disease condition um, uh, model. So we did find um, that there was indeed the um, increased uh, lymphocyte, or really uh, inflammatory infiltrate within the colons of the mice, which we expected. The question is now what's happening in the prostate? So number one, we wanted to make sure that the, this DSS wasn't directly somehow being um, filtered by the gut and going into the kidney. And the top represents mouse colon, and this purple on the right um, represents DSS treated. Hopefully you guys can see that. And you can see this toluidine um, staining of the mice, uh, sorry, in the colon, so the colon of the mice. But in the bottom, you can see that the um, mouse prostate, in neither case, actually, did we see any of these toluidine staining, suggesting that any signal that we were potentially seeing was not just a direct effect of DSS going into the prostates of these mice. So what we found is, number one, in, no, this is all in prostate tissue, that in mice, that there was a higher level of overall leukocytes and specifically CD8 cells. Now, it's a little bit different than the human counterpart, but you know this was really exploratory. Um, that if mice had colitis, there was a higher level of leukocyte infiltration, specifically CD8 cells within this cohort. Um, and then we, we looked at a few more mice and found that, again, the CD45 is a general leukocyte antigen uh, marker that when you gave these mice colitis, um, there was a significantly increased amount of CD45, CD8, and uh, uh, B220 cells, which are uh, uh, B cells, uh, within the mice of these prostates, suggesting that there may be something associated with gut um, associated inflammation that's being transmitted to the prostate. This was not a transmural process. That means we didn't see all this inflammation um, going uh, through the mucosa of the colon into the prostates. Um, uh, you know, the intervening tissue was not affected, that truly this may be some kind of uh, inflammatory or bacterial or uh, process that's being transmitted. We looked at inflammatory cytokines. So this was a, a panel of inflammatory cytokines, and we expected to see certain cytokines like TNF-alpha actually increase, and it wasn't. It was actually decreased. Um, uh, IL-6, which uh, some of the work that uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Jennifer Wu, has done, has shown that's an increased risk, or sorry, um, can, and can, her IL-6 mouse model shows that it may be associated with increased risk of prostate cancer uh, via inflammation, but there were a whole slew of um, uh, cytokines that were increased within the prostates of the mice that had col uh, colitis, and we're going to focus on the the, the last three here because they were the most uh, the most highly expressed. And um, I'm not going to belabor this point, but essentially there were three things that were most highly expressed. These were um, something called TIMP, CCL5, and CXCL1. And what TIMP is, it's an extracellular model, extracellular matrix remodeling protein. High levels of TIMP are associated with uh, uh, progression in certain types of cancers. CCL5 is a chemotactic cytokine for immune cells, and uh, CXCL1 is also a chemokine which um, is involved in neutrophil recruitment and trafficking. And what we found is that in the in the bottom here, um, that you can see that there were higher levels of TIMP, CCL5, and CXCL1, um, as demonstrated by the strain staining in the mouse. So, is there other data suggesting that these agents that I just spoke about, these cytokines that I just talked about, is associated with either cancer progression or development? And the answer is yes. TIMP1 has been well established in colon, um, uh, which is associated through, uh, with essentially through uh, AKT phosphorylation of the PI3 kinase pathway, as associated with a progression and metastasis within colon cancer. Um, it's also been shown in pancreatic cancer, and it's also been shown on CX, uh, sorry, CXCL1 in uh, pancreatic cancer and CCL5 in lung cancer. Um, there actually is data within prostate cancer. If there's a high, a prostates that have higher levels of TIMP1, again, which is an extracellular matrix remodeling cytokine, that it show it, it has a higher level of progression, um, uh, cancer progression within these patients with prostate cancer.
And there is data as well with CXCL1 and CCL5 in um, uh, progression of prostate cancer. Um, so there is data actually supporting that independently of how the gut inflammation is associated with it. And these are Western blots essentially looking at um, some of the downstream um, uh, regulators uh, that are associated with upregulation of these genes, specifically, or cytokines, specifically NF-kappa B um, phosphorylation, which you see is significantly increased within um, uh, the colitis mice. AKT phosphorylation is also significantly increased in um, mice with colitis, which you're seeing here. And then we did look at MYC because a lot of these AKT phosphorylation, um, uh, you know, with some of the work that we were doing with Sarki, Abdul Qadir, um, in the his uh, C MYC mouse models, um, we looked at MYC and, 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 and there was an increase in MYC expression within the mice prostates of uh, that that had colitis. Uh, oxidative stress. So in colon cancer. Um, Inflammation induces oxidative stress, and we use this marker called gamma H2AX and did show that there was an increase in oxidative stress leading to DNA damage. Um, the red represents uh, the amount of staining for um, this DNA, da DNA damage marker, and it was higher in the prostates in uh, mice with colitis. And then um, also another marker of uh, reactive oxygen species and how that potentially can cause um, DNA damage, this 4-HNE. Uh, you can see on the bottom here, there's much more intense staining of this 4-HNE stain um, in mice with colitis than in um, control mice. So this is the hypothesis. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with this, but that they're the murine prostates or these mouse prostates or mouse, uh, uh, the mouse gut when it's inflamed demonstrates increased levels of immune cells um, and pro-inflammatory cytokines like TIMP1, CXCL, CXCL1, and CCL5, which ultimately can alter um, the local environment and potentially make this more um, tumor permissive um, than in a non-inflamed prostate. Um, this may cause downstream um, dysregulation or upregulation of the AKT phosphorylation, NF-kappa B, and the MYC pathways, which can be associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer, and ultimately DNA damage, uh, reactive oxygen species may uh, lead to cellular senescence and, and, and essentially be permissive of um, cancer cell um, growth and, and, and uh, maintenance as opposed to cell death. So I think one of the main questions that we are in the process of studying uh, or looking at is the microbiome. So, you know, the microbiome for me is, is, is a little bit hard to uh, grasp completely. I think it's hard for many people to grasp, but there's many different microbiomes. There's a urinary microbiome, a skin microbiome, obviously a gut microbiome. But one of the things we started to do is look at um, human, uh, human prostate tissue and we actually did this work with Gene Chang at the University of Chicago, where he stained um, these human tissue in controls versus uh, men with IVD and found that there was a higher level of 16S ribosomal RNA expression within the um, prostates in men with IVD. Now, unfortunately, what we don't have is the what type of bacteria is this. Is this. We don't know if it's a, it's a, if it's a urinary bacteria, or a gut bacteria. And so what we're trying to do is establish a mouse model. And he has a nice IL-10 mouse model um, that when you get these IL-10 knockout mouse, when they get exposed to certain bacteria, which their previous mouse room had, they invariably got IBD. Unfortunately, recently they changed their mouse room and it's too clean. And so while we're trying to give them IBD, the mouse room is too clean and they're not getting IBD. So we're rethinking that and seeing what we can do um, but we're trying to establish to see what, what if, what is the effect of the microbiome, and specifically what we want to try and do is give them a controlled ingestion of certain bacteria and see if these bacteria within the gut are making it into the prostate, suggesting that truly there may be an effect or in IBD and inflammation of the of the gut that's making it into the prostate. So a little preliminary. So I hope more to come on that. Next, I'm going to move on to the shared genetics. So 
you know, one other question, and we we know that IBD, there are many SNPs that are single nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with an increased risk of both prostate cancer, and similarly, the same with IBD. So what we did is work with uh, John Witte at UCSF, um, who has now just transitioned to Stanford, where we first looked at genome-wide association studies and two large genome-wide association study um, cohorts including practical within the prostate cancer data set and delaying, which is a huge GUAS um, cohort for IBD. Um, and we found that there were many genes that were uh, so, uh, in, uh, SNPs, I should say, that were increased in both. Um, but one of the challenges I found with the GWAS studies is while we find SNPs, we don't actually know the functional, uh, functional impact. So what we chose to do next or, and, and more recently is looking at transcriptome um, analyses in patients with IBD and prostate cancer. So to do this, we used a certain program called the Metascan um, to test for the association between imputed gene expression within the tissue of patients with uh, prostate cancer and IBD and then subtype them as well. Um, now, this is a global uh, tissue data set, imputed tissue data, data set. So, you know, we will start looking at specifically gut and prostate, um, uh, but this was all tissues and looked at overlapping genes that had essentially the same direction, i.e. they were both increased or decreased. Um, and what we found within the tissue-wide association is there was a handful of genes which are here in the red um, that were associated in the same direction that were co-expressed or meaning uh, they were associated, they had increased expression in both IBD and, and, flame, and, and prostate cancer. Uh, the red are significant. What I'd like to point out is this one gene that I'm very interested in, this TNFR SF6B. Essentially, it's a um, TNF alpha uh, superfamily gene, which is associated with an increased risk of pro uh, sorry, cancer progression. Um, in many cancers. So it just in the overall IBD and prostate cancer, TNF, this TNF supergene uh, came up. And then we looked at individual uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and they had differences. But what was most striking is this TNF alpha supergene um, was the most strongly uh, upregulated or, up, uh, or, or expressed in both, um, in both cohorts. So um, these are the genes. Uh, these are the genes that were most um, highly expressed in both, um, and I have a lot of work to do as to figure out what this interaction is. But again, what is this TNF uh, six gene? It's a TNF alpha super member, super family member, um, and what's interesting is it actually serves as a decoy receptor. So, in certain cancers, what happens is this serves as a decoy receptor which actually reduces the risk of some of the TNF alpha mediated death of some of the cancer cells. Um, we did gene enrichment analysis just to say, are there certain gene sets or gene uh, uh, sets which are co-expressed um, or co-op-regulated? And a lot of it, and the answer is yes. Um, a lot of these are immune uh, regulatory gene sets, uh, which absolutely makes sense from an IBD standpoint, but it, there seems to be some um, uh, co-mingling within the prostate cancer uh, cohort as well. And this last little thing looked at, um, we asked the computer to say which genes are upregulated and are the disease sets that um, uh, uh, are expressed in both. And then you can see here on the on the right side here, for example, IBD and IBD, the, the dot is large, that's so the biggest dot you can get. Uh, we don't actually query, we didn't actually query IBD, rather the computer, even though it's a small dot, it's a significant um, finding that um, within the gene sets that are upregulated, inflammatory bowel disease and prostate cancer, while it's a small um, small group of gene sets, there were a statistically significant uh, number of gene sets that were co-upregulated in both inflammatory bowel disease and prostate cancer. So this hey, is Shom, can I ask you, Shom? Ted, yes. I have a quick question for you. Um, were the you alluded to this? Um, immune modulatory networks that were altered. W the patients who you profiled, were they on or not on any uh, immunosuppressants for their IBD or what's the story behind their medication use? Yeah, these are large cohorts of practical and the language. I don't, we don't have that annotated data. So these are all GWAS-based studies. Um, I see. 
I, I don't have annota individual annotated data. So I, I don't have, for example, how long they were taking TNFs, if they were. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges with some of this data is you can get uh, population based or genome based data, but it's hard to get individual patient data. So this is uh, work that was done by Adam Wiener. Um, what we looked at is, uh, and this is uh, work with um, Dr. Schaefer and Tamara Loten um, from Hopkins. We looked at this specific gene. Now this, this, this figure is a little bit misleading in the sense that um, these were not IBD patients, but rather there was a co cohort of about 500 men who underwent radical prostatectomy. Um, who had tissue expression done, and what we isolated is this particular gene, actually the whole set of genes that I just showed you previously. And this came out as probably the most significant gene within the cohort, within the, the set that I just showed you, this TNF-alpha super gene, which essentially is associated with TNF-alpha dysregulation in cancer. And if you had high levels of TNF, this TNF super gene expression in prostate cancer patients, that it was associated with a higher risk of prostate cancer metastasis, taking into account and adjusting for PSA, grade group, margin status, and decipher. So I think it's just hypothesis generating um, the fact that I think the TNF story could be playing a role within this whole um, inflammatory cascade. I will say one thing, Shom, about the data set. Yes. And that is that entire data set was collated and organized by Ashley Ross. So although it's always referred to as the low tan set now, because she's the only one remaining at Hopkins, <clears throat> actually Ashley did all that work. Well, Ashley, thank you. This figure then, I, I need a I'm shout out to, to Ashley Ross here then. I'm happy to see it going to good use. <laughs> um, so the last question I wanted to answer as I wrap up here is, you know, what happens with TNF agents? So I'll tell you with, with patients taking TNF off of medications. So is there, what is the effect of TNF-alpha? Because we always think of it as an immunosuppressive agent. So we know that there's an increased risk of lymphoma, um, but if you actually give TNF agents to uh, IBD patients, for example, you significantly reduce their risk of prostate, I'm sorry, uh, colon cancer. And so these patients can almost have a colon cancer risk that's as close to the general population if they're on a TNF-alpha agent, if you really abrogate some of these inflammatory signals. But the long-term effects of uh, long-term data on how TNF-alpha agents affect cancer risk is terrible, mainly because most of the studies, including the meta-analyses, and we're about to publish ours soon, um, are really pretty poor because they look at one, two-year data, and they're looking at really efficacy of the, uh, of the medication, and they're not looking at long-term cancer diagnoses. So we hope to have data for you soon um, on that. But we wanted to look at, our, and what does TNF do? So we know in high levels of TNF, with high levels of TNF, it can induce endothelial cell death, tumor necrosis, and tumor regression. But actually with, in, with low levels of TNF and chronic TNF, there actually can be um, a tumor permissive environment because it can actually cause death of CD8 tumor and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. It actually can increase PDL1 expression on cancer cells. And then chronic low levels of uh, uh, production of TNF can actually be uh, can affect immunosuppressive T cells such as T regulatory cells um, and actually cause uh, tumor progression. So TNF, the story of TNF is not straightforward, at least not to me. Um, but I wanted to see what happened within our cohort. So TNF, as I said, can induce cell death, but actually in low levels, it can serve as a tumor promoter by um, promoting myeloid cells, angiogenesis, killing CD8, CD8 cells, um, and uh, increased PDL1 expression on tumor cells. So what about the TNF alpha blockade on prostate cancer risk? We actually looked at all cancers, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just gonna focus on prostate cancer. What we did is looked at our NM system-wide inquiry. And again, as you said, uh, Ted, we really don't know when these population-based um, data, who was taking a TNF, how long, why, um, for what reason. So that was one of the strengths of our, uh, one, one of the strengths of our own um, uh, NM system data set, where we looked at 10,000 patients 
who were exposed to a TNF agent, including patients with inflammatory bowel disease, but we actually also included psoriasis and clothing spondylitis, psoriasis, oops, psoriasis is there twice, and rheumatoid arthritis. And we had 10,000 patients, and we matched those. Actually, we didn't match. We actually took every patient in our system with those particular conditions, and there were 38,000 patients. And we found that 10,000 of them were exposed to TNF-alpha inhibitor, and 28,000, at least within our own prescription data, did not have any exposure to a TNF-alpha agent. And we wanted to see what the risk of cancer was. So interestingly, what we found is um, we did propensity weighting because there were some differences, but when we accounted for and adjusted for age, PSA, number of screening exams, uh, number of visits um, and smoking status and other things like that, that there was a significantly protective effect against the diagnosis of prostate cancer um, in this cohort. I just included some of the other cancers which I'm interested in looking at. There seemed to be a slightly protective effect on kidney cancer and bladder cancer. Um, and we're working on teasing out the individual data. It does not seem that there were differences in specific leasing grade, at least preliminarily. But this um, effect, um, you know, we tried to figure out factors that were maybe asso associated with bias, and you never can really get away with reducing all bias within um, this cohort or retrospective cohort, but it seemed to be pretty strongly protective. Um, what about the disease state for which they were used? Um, as expected, and as we would hope to um, see based upon other data, with all sort of colitis and Crohn's, um, the, this is a relative risk of one. It seemed to be protective. I don't know how to explain the psoriasis because this is something we looked at, but certainly something we're going to go look look for, look look to in the future. Um, psoriasis patients seem to have the highest, uh, or sorry, the the greatest protective effect, and um, and I've included it here, but I, I can't tell you much about it. But it does show within the uh, inflamed gut cohort that there was a protective effect and. Actually, in the overall cohort, a lot of these inflammatory driven cancers, i.e. colon cancer, liver cancer, stomach cancer, it showed that it was protective, which is what we expect from known data. So I think there may be something to this that I hope to be able to elucidate in the future. So with that, I'm going to conclude and I want to just make some uh, concluding remarks here. Um, I believe there is an association with uh, uh, IBD and prostate cancer and in our cohorts and some of our population data population-based data, uh, IBD is associated with an increased risk of a prostate cancer diagnosis in a man's lifetime. So I would say for those of you seeing IBD patients, don't uh, just assume it's from gut inflammation only. In preclinical models, gut inflammation is associated with a pro-oncogenic milieu uh, in the prostate, not just in the gut. And there may be um, a shared genetic profile in these men with IBD and prostate cancer, which we hope to kind of tease out over time. Um, this TNF-alpha superfamily gene, which I think is very interesting and seemed to be kind of the uh, standout in terms of um, this entire TWAS-based evaluation, is something that I think is very interesting. And I, and I think the use of TNF-alpha inhibitors, interesting, was prospect, pro, oh, sorry, protective against the diagnosis of prostate cancer. But the mechanisms, um, you know, are yet unclear and we hope we'll be able to tease that out. I wanted to thank all the members of Dr. Uh, Abdul Qadir's lab and Uj and Vinay, um, who really helped kind of move this forward. Uh, I wanted to thank Connor Driscoll, who is one of our, um, <coughs> excuse me, PGY1 residents, um, who's moved a lot of the TNF stuff forward. And I think there'll there'll be a lot of data coming out, uh, not only in prostate cancer, but some of the other data sets that we have. Um, and the UCSF team, which has helped uh, to navigate some of the genetics-based work and hopefully help us figure out what the shared genetic basis of this phenomenon may be. So thanks everyone for your attention and I'm happy to <laughs> entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. <coughs> um, so if a person, say a person has IBD um, and you know they, their disease is not severe enough that they need to be on TNF-alpha, like particularly with, with ulcerative colitis, um, a couple of questions. One is, so should we inform or they inter or inform internists or the patients that look, you need prostate cancer screening and what age should that begin? Like at 40? Um, like, and then the second follow up is, um, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't ever recommend TNF blockade for them in, in any way, right? I think that's a 
Th those are really interesting questions. I think I'm really interested by the TNF alpha story because I think that seems to be kind of where things are converging based upon um, at least some of the genetic based work and some of the clinical work. So I'm going to go back. So, you know, where the PSAs tend to diverge is um, starting at the age of 55 or so. Sorry, let me get to it here. So, you know, right at the age of 55, you start to see a significant difference between the two. So I, I think the whole point is um, in all of this is number one, if you have patients with IBD, maybe they will serve as a higher risk cohort that should be uh, considered for screening or maybe considered higher risk that we need to evaluate our screening based practices. I think internists and um, GI doctors, but probably the internists should be educated that elevations in PSA no, uh, shouldn't be just treated as IBD flares or gut inflammation and presumed to be nothing, which is uh, what I've seen a handful of times, more than a handful of times. Um, and that, that this group maybe truly represents a group that we need to study and recognize as a high risk cohort. Now, in terms of TNF use, I can't say, I think it's very interesting because if there is something with local prostate inflammation, and then if you really knock out or mitigate this TNF story, you're not using it for prostate cancer prevention, but it seemed to be within the cohort um, that there was a reduced risk of prostate cancer diagnosis. Now, you these patients are always seen more frequently. So if you have mild disease, you're probably not being seen as someone who has severe disease, who's getting more, um, you know, office-based visits with their rheumatologist, their GI doctor and whatnot. So, you know, it certainly could be ascertainment bias or, or bias that they're in the system more, but the patients who are getting the TNF agents actually seem to be more engaged in the healthcare system, but they're being diagnosed with prostate cancer less. So I think it's a really interesting mechanism that I think is worthwhile studying because TNF plays a role in both obviously development and progression. So I think that'll be interesting to study, but, um, uh, I, ho I hope to tease that out in the future here. Thank Shom. you. <clears throat> yeah, Shom, awesome work, total tour de force. Um, how um, do you think about next steps of translating some of the mouse observations <clears throat> into uh, humans? Meaning, are you prospectively banking tissue from these individuals and if so, can you tell us more about that so we can participate or, um, you know, what are your next steps in terms of translating that? Yeah, I think that is the next step. You know, we're trying to get more tissue and I have, um, you know, working with Jennifer, she has some tissue from IBD patients in her um, uh, in her lab. I think she got some from Dan Lynn, you know, 16 years ago that are sitting in her lab that she's interested. She's going to help um, kind of tease out you know, what's happening with the tumor microenvironment in these men with inflammation and prostate cancer. That data, I think, will be annotated. So it's not a large sample, but she may have about 50 patients that hopefully she'll be able to tease out. Um, I do have to start a more prospective banking um, program and specifically with the Digestive Health Foundation, our GI, because I want to know not only know what's going on with the, I want, with the prostate tissue, but the colon tissue as well. Um, so yes, I think your point is a is a is a really good one. We need to I need to start banking. I have plenty of tissue. I have a reasonable amount of tissue that has been um, previously uh, paraffin embedded, and I have some of that tissue from both here and um, uh, and UFC where we're doing some of the um, uh, the microbiome based work. I'm trying to figure out what bacteria are there, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's a little bit of an ordeal, um, but something that I, I, I do have to chase down prospectively and figure out the right way and how to get colon tissue because they take biopsies randomly in a lot of these colon tissue patients, but not everybody gets a, a biopsy. Uh, with the with transperineal biopsies, I know there's a lot of hesitation, for example, with Steve Heinauer to really getting any kind of prostate tissue and, and inflamed tissue in inflamed patients. But with transperineal, since we're actually not piercing the rectum, there may be an opportunity to get some prostate tissue when patients are having flares and things like that. So yes, absolutely, that will be a part of the next step. I think a lot of it is just trying to understand the tumor microenvironment and what's happening. This is beyond the scope of what I know, but you know, luckily we have people who can help with that um going forward so you're right we that's something that i will need to start <laughs>
Yeah, I think the transperineal biopsy approach would be really nice for that, right? Because you can have a clean field, so to speak. Exactly. And I think there was hesitation before, you know, this was two, three years ago, but with transperineal really without violating, you know, the, the, the rectal mucosa, I think becomes a potentially different um, game. And these patients are sedated. So, you know, we'll have to go through the IRB process, but it would nice, be nice to get prostate tissue in some of these patients with IBD and then localize based upon what's happening with the different diseases. So you see and Crohn's are very different. So um, I think it'd be really interesting to see if somebody with Crohn's and an ileal flare is having upregulated, uh, you know, what's happening in the prostate in those patients versus somebody with rectal sort of colitis. So um, yeah, I think it would be, it'll, it'll, I think it'll change the game as it relates to being able to get tissue and not disturbing the, the local inflammation of the gut. All right, thank you everyone. Any, any other questions? Well, thanks everyone for listening. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thanks Ashley for inviting me and uh, look forward to working with all of you soon. Thank, thank you, Sean. Um, really great. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean.